Okay, so we are going to start chapter six now uh, from the book, which is on time and frequency characterization of signals and systems. And one of the things we are going to understand in this particular chapter is how does um, constraints on the frequency response affects the time uh, domain characteristics of the signal and vice versa. Constraints on the time domain, how does that affect the frequency response of the system? So to build the background, let's go back to chapter two and chapter three, sorry, chapter two and then chapter three to five. So in chapter two, we had this figure. We have a system with impulse response H of T. We give it an input X of T. The output is H of T convolution X of T. Okay, so this was the story in chapter two. I can compute the output of the system of the LTI system for any input, as long as I'm given the impulse response of that particular LTI system by just taking the convolution of the impulse response with the input X of T. Now, in chapter three to five, we learned about Fourier series and Fourier transform and we realize that actually, I don't want to do convolution. Convolution is very complicated uh, integration. What I'm going to instead do is, I'm going to take the Fourier transform of all the signals involved. And it turns out that the convolution just becomes the multiplication in the frequency response case. Okay, so this was the story in chapter three to five. Convolution in time domain is multiplication in frequency domain and vice versa. And the equation that relates these two H of T and capital H of J omega is the following expression. where H of J omega is a Fourier transform of the impulse response of the system. Okay, now here is the breaking news. Since we have um, distilled the essence of chapter two and chapter three to five, which is basically whatever we have studied so far in this one figure, it's easy to understand that any constraint on H of T would reflect a constraint on capital H of J omega and vice versa, any constraint on capital H of J omega is going to constrain the possibilities on H of T that you can have. In particular, what we are going to study in today's class and in maybe Friday's class is as follows. Uh, a low pass filter yields a sluggish response. Sluggish response to step input or impulse input. Okay, any input that changes. So step input changes from zero to one within uh, within an infinitesimal time step and impulse input goes from zero to infinity to zero within an infinitesimal time step. Okay, so if you have a low pass filter, you will get a sluggish response to step input or impulse input. Okay, these are all qualitative statement and we'll make it more precise as we pass through today's lecture. 
but this is the qualitative picture I want to uh, give before we start the discussion. On the other hand, if you want a fast response, from a system, then it must pass uh, it must pass larger number of frequencies. In other words, it has to pass higher frequency, like higher values of frequencies. Uh, only then the system will respond very fast to an input. Are you saying that the frequency value has to be high or the number of frequencies coming in has to be high? Uh, so, what I what I want to say is, let's say your h of j omega versus omega. So one system has h of j omega that looks like this. The other system has h of j omega that looks like this. So this second h2, h2 is passing higher number of frequencies, right? Larger number of frequencies. Uh, so therefore, H2 will have a much faster response in comparison to H1. That's what I mean by statement two. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Now let's go back to this uh, statement, uh, not the statement, but this, this equation. And let's look at the breaking news. So a low pass filter, so I'm, I'm constraining the H of J omega to be a low pass filter. And suddenly we realize that a low pass filter would yield a sluggish response to a step input or an impulse input. So H of T will grow or decay very, very slowly in this case. On the other hand, Let's say we have a requirement that H of T has to be extremely fast. It has to react very fast to the changes and to the input. Um, then in that case, you want to make sure that your H of J omega passes a larger number of frequencies. Uh, I don't want to say it should be a high pass filter. It just should pass larger number of frequencies so that you can get a much faster response from the system in time domain. So by constraining the time domain characteristic or by constraining the frequency domain characteristic, you automatically constrain the other part of the system. So if you constrain the frequency domain, you constrain the time domain characteristic, you constrain the time domain uh, characteristic of the system, you automatically constrain the frequency domain characteristics of the system as well. And so therefore, if you, you know, many a times you would want to constrain both the time domain characteristic as well as frequency domain characteristics uh, because of the nature of the system, particularly examples being communication systems where both of them, you want to reject the noise from the system, but at the same time, you don't want to introduce unnecessary delays within the system uh, because, uh, because when people are talking, they want almost real time performance. They don't want to have any delays or any attenuation in the signal where the words are breaking off and voices breaking off and things like that. We don't like it. We don't like it as consumers. So therefore businesses have to design systems so that they constrain both the time domain characteristics as well as the frequency domain characteristics. And that's where a lot of engineering knowledge and uh, engineering know-how comes into the picture. Okay, and that's what pretty much many of you who will go into engineering firms in the future, this is pretty much what your entire life is going to be, which is to figure out uh, how to design the system so that it meets all the criteria. And there is a lot of trade-offs you will have to make, both in terms of the cost of the components, as well as the characteristics of the components in the frequency domain and in the time domain. Now, so far, uh, we haven't talked much in terms of equations. So let's look at some specific example. Um, any questions so far before we move on to example? Okay. 
let's look at a simple first order system. And I'm going to assume that my, uh, my um, impulse response is e raised to minus a t u t. So the RC system typically have this kind of response. If you're looking at the potential difference across the capacitor, A is some constant greater than zero. Automatically H of J omega becomes one over one plus A plus J omega. And I also want to look at the step input. So impulse input is one uh, type of response of the system and then step input is another. H of T convolution U of T. Uh, let's try to find what Y of T is going to be. Uh, it's convolution, so it should be integral minus infinity to infinity. H of tau, U of T minus tau, D tau. Okay, so how should I do the computation of this integral? Any thoughts? Could we set the uh, new limits zero to infinity? Uh, zero to, well, we can do zero to infinity, but let's do zero to T because this term okay. will go to zero after T. So you are right. So it will be zero to T e raised to minus a tau d tau. Uh, I hope I can integrate this. What do I get? One over a, one minus e raised to minus a t. So this is the step response of the system. Any question? Okay, as A is greater than zero, so this term is actually going to decay to zero. E raised to negative 80 will decay to zero as t goes to infinity. Okay, now let's plot the step response, the impulse response, the step response, and the um, the absolute value of h of j omega as a function of omega. So h of t is e raised to negative a t u t. h of j omega is one over a plus j omega. And y of t is one over a, one minus e raised to negative a t. UT. This is a first order RC system. Well, okay, let's look at H of J Omega first. as a function of omega, it's going to look something like this. So 
what's this value? This is zero. What is H of zero? It's one over A. Now let's look at, at omega equals to A. What would this value be? Absolute value of H of J A. Can someone tell me what this absolute value is going to look like? Anyone wants to tell me what the value is? Absolute value of H of J A. Would it just be one half A, one over two A? Uh, square root of two actually. Okay. Yeah, quite close. So it's one over A square root of two. Now, if you look at the, um, the output energy, so from the low frequency value, so at the low frequency value, uh, it's H of J omega, absolute value of H of J omega is one over A. So the square of absolute value basically tells you some idea about the energy content of the signal for small frequency. So in, the, in this case, uh, when omega is greater than A, so if I'm looking at this region, If I'm looking at omega is greater than A, then the energy content is going to be less than half because energy content is, energy is directly proportional to H of J omega square. Okay, so the energy content will be halved or it will be lower than half uh, after for values of omega greater than a. Okay, every everyone is on the same page so far. Fairly straightforward computations. Okay, now let's look at now. So now we have understood that if I in, if I increase the value of a. Okay, let me write it. What's the upshot? If we increase A, then a larger number of frequencies will be passed through the system. Okay, all of us agree with this conclusion by looking at this graph of absolute value of H of J omega. We all agree with it. Okay. Now let's look at A equals to one. This is my H of T and my H of T is going to be zero, then it will decay like this. This is E raised to negative KT. So let me write it E raised to negative T. This is time. If I look at the, uh, the step response, Y of T, y of t is going to look like
this is also a equals to one. And this is one minus e raised to negative t. Okay, now let's increase the value of a. Okay, so as we increase, remember this upshot, if we increase the value of a, we are going to pass a larger number of frequencies through the system, okay? That's what our understanding was by looking at the graph of absolute value of h of j omega. Let's increase the value of a and let's try to plot the same time responses. Let me say a is equal to 10. This is e raised to minus 10 t. Let me draw ut. A is equal to 10. And the step response is going to be Is that UT or YT? Oh, this is YT, sorry. Yeah, this is Y of T. This is the step response. So what do we notice? Seems like when h of t goes low, y of t goes high. Right. That is the characteristic because it's 1 minus e raised to negative 10t. So it's 1 minus h of t. So certainly like if h of t is going to 0 very fast, y of t is going to the steady state value 1 over 10 very, very fast. But I wanted to contrast the responses for a equals to one with the responses for a equals to 10, because as we have mentioned previously, if we increase the value of a, we are basically passing a larger number of frequencies through the system without much attenuation. Uh, so the higher value of a uh, makes it reach steady state much faster. Much faster, right? That's, the, that's our observation that if we increase the value of a, which means if we are passing higher number of frequencies from the system, then our responses are going to also be very, very fast with respect to the step input or with respect to the impulse input. Okay, so we reach the steady state much faster. And that's the uh, uh, design uh, issue that we were talking about, that if you want to constrain the frequency response, you automatically uh, constrain the time response in an appropriate fashion. So you can't have a system that passes high frequency and that has a sluggish response to the step input or a impulse input. It's just not possible. If your supervisor asks you to build such a system, you can easily tell him or her that it's not possible. It's physically not possible. Not only that I cannot make it, nobody else in the universe can make such a system for you. Okay, so 
the conclusion is a system that passes well this is of course a first order system example that we are looking at but it's true more generally that a system that passes larger number of frequencies reach steady state faster okay so if you want to reach your steady state as fast as possible you must uh, be able to pass a larger number of frequencies, particularly you need to pass higher range of frequencies, higher, uh, higher frequencies through the system. So that way the response is going to be very swift to any changes to the input. Let's look at another example. Any questions so far in this example? This is the key three figures or uh, four figures that I want you to remember. Okay. Let's look at another example of ideal filter. Uh, let's talk about low pass. So the ideal low pass filter in time domain is going to look like this. One for omega less than omega C, zero for omega greater than omega C. Now, what's the impulse response of this system? Let's look at H of T, and it's given by sine omega CT over pi T. And this is for for all time. Of course, when t goes to zero, you have to take the limit t goes to zero and you will get an appropriate value for the limiting case. I'm pulling up the frequency response. There it is. So it looks like this is pi over omega c. This is omega c over pi. Sorry, this is minus pi. This is pi over omega c. So it sort of decays as t goes to infinity, the value of h of t goes to zero, which is kind of evident by looking at the expression for h of t itself because t is in the denominator and the numerator is bounded from above by minus one and one. What else do you notice about this impulse response of this ideal filter? 
it looks more like a band pass than a low pass. Uh, well, this is this is a low pass. Well, this is the H of J omega. This is an ideal filter. So H of J omega is passing all frequencies between minus omega C to C. What this is actually H of T. So you can't oh. determine whether it's a band pass or a low pass by looking at H of T. Okay, I was looking at the wrong thing then, sorry. No worries. So, so there is something very special about this impulse response. What is so special about this impulse response? Is it that it uh, goes into the negatives? A yeah, bit? right, 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 right. So it's non-causal. It's a non-causal system because even though the impulse input is given at time t equals to zero, this particular system seems to have a response before time t equals to zero. So this is t equals to zero point and we have a non-zero response before t equals to zero. So that's why it's a non-causal system because it has, an, it has a response even before the input was given, even before the impulse input was given because impulse input always uh, has its infinity at time t equals to zero and then it's zero everywhere else. So the input is actually given only at time t equals to zero. So this is a non-causal system. So if you want an ideal, let's say you're, uh, you're working in some setting where you don't have the entire time series. And because you don't have the entire time series, you can't really operate on the entire time series at once. And therefore you have to design uh, a filter, which is causal, a filter that takes as input, everything that has happened so far, and then uses that for filtering. It can't anticipate what's going to happen in the future. If that is the case, you can't really have an ideal filter there because an ideal filter is going to be non-causal. So you can't create a causal filter out of it. This is another instance where a restriction in the frequency domain automatically leads to a restriction in the time domain. And in this case, the restriction is pretty significant because it's a non-causal filter. Okay, so whenever you design systems, you have to keep in mind that your frequency characteristics that you would ideally like to have must also respect some of the time characteristics that the system will have due to the design itself. So that's why um, uh, when when you're doing when you're doing development of filters, you have to and in cases where you cannot have the entire time series. So, for instance, um, at this time I'm speaking into the microphone, and that microphone has to take my voice as input, uh, move it all across the internet infrastructure to your home or to your speaker. And that has to be a causal system. It can't be a non-causal system. Now, after I have recorded this video and I look at the entire you know, audio signal from the beginning of the lecture all the way to the end of the lecture, I can have a non-ideal filter because it doesn't have to be causal. I, I can use any, sorry, I can use an ideal filter to filter any noise or anything that I don't want to have in the, in the audio, I can remove it. All of it is possible because then I'm not doing a, uh, because I have the entire time series in front of me. So I, I'm not restricted by the causality of the signal. Okay, so depending on the application, you may be able to use ideal filters or you may not be able to use ideal filters. But more often in life, we would, live, we would prefer to have a, a real filter, which is causal, because in most situations in day-to-day -day activity, we need to filter things. We need to filter noise in a um, in a causal fashion. 
because we can't anticipate what's going to happen in the future. You can't anticipate this. The internet cannot anticipate which word I'm going to say in the future. So it has to be a causal uh, system. So when you design real filters, you can't really expect the characteristics of an ideal filter where uh, up to some critical frequency, you are passing all the signal. And after the critical frequency, you're not passing any signal. So in real filters, that's not possible. So you have to have some um, approximation of ideal filters. So how do you approximate the ideal filter? So here is your omega. Here is your H of J omega, absolute value. And let's say you again want to talk about low pass filter. Then you would define a band one plus delta one, one minus delta one, and then another band, which is delta two. And this is my omega P and this is my omega S. And when you're designing an ideal filter, you can't have that strict cutoff. So what you will try to have is you can move around within this band and then there is going to be some transition and then you are going to have some other characteristic of this absolute value of H of J omega. And this is the stop band, this is called the stop band which of course depends on the choice of delta 2 you have the thresholds that you have set for the stop band this is the pass band and this is the transition Omega P is called pass band edge. So this is the set of frequencies that are almost passed by the, uh, by the system. Um, I, what I mean by almost is that there is some um, attenuation. There could be some attenuation. You could have one minus Delta one, or you could have some amplification one plus Delta one, but you will pretty much pass the signal with a slight attenuation or a slight amplification for frequencies in the pass band. In the transition band, things are a bit more complicated. So initially you are passing the frequencies and then in the later on you are sort of uh, attenuating the frequencies. Um, sorry, you are attenuating throughout but you're attenuating very less in the early, in, in frequencies closer to omega P but you're attenuating a lot more frequencies closer to omega S. And then after omega s, you're pretty much attenuating all the frequencies, but you're not completely making it zero. The, the attenuation is only of the order of delta two or less, okay? So delta two could be 0 0.05, which means that you are attenuating the amplitude of the signal by 0 0.05.
uh, which in some applications could be okay. Otherwise you want to make Delta two equals to 0 0.01 or 0 0.001, depending on the application and the quality of signal you want. Okay, so this is how you would design an ideal filter where you cannot really have, sorry, you can design a real filter, which is causal uh, by not having a strict cutoff of omega C, but you will have a pass band, you will have a transition band, and you will have a stop band in the filter. Okay, so such tolerances are something that that's part of the design process, how much tolerance, so this is tolerance number one, this is tolerance number two. This is all part of the design process. And uh, you have to spend quite a bit of effort to figure out what the design should be so that the system is maintained over long periods of time. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, we use AC signal at, in our home, right? And the AC signal has certain frequency close to 60 Hertz, perhaps 59.99 Hertz to 60.01 Hertz. And we have a uh, AC signal of the order of 110 volt. 110 volt is sort of the average uh, voltage. The real voltage actually, of course, is sinusoidal. So it'll be like 170 sine omega T or something. Uh, that's the kind of voltage we are getting in our homes. Now our home refrigerator, dishwasher, air conditioning system, all of it can take this energy and it can convert it into something that's useful for us in our day-to-day -day activity. So washer, dryer, air conditioning system, refrigerator, dishwasher, these are, and the electric bulbs and fans and whatever, these are the things we generally use in our homes. Now, if you go to the industrial setting, let's say you are going into, uh, uh, a data center or you're going into a very large manufacturing plant, they really can't take the direct energy that's coming from the grid and directly use it for running their machinery because many of those machineries are very precision machinery and they want, they want the signal to be almost sinusoid. They want the voltage to be almost sinusoid. They want the frequency to be uh, 60, within 59.99999 hertz to 60.00001 hertz. Okay, so their tolerance is extremely small. And how do they get that sort of uh, signal? Well, they have large UPSs, which is connected to the battery and which is connected to some other auxiliary power sources. And all of it tries to create the signal, which looks exactly what is needed for entering that machinery that you have in the industrial setting. And so in those cases, the cost of UPS is included, like it's part of the facility and they have to spend that money to buy the UPS because otherwise their machinery would break down very often if the quality of the signal is not good enough, if the quality of the input sinusoid that they are getting is not good enough. But our homes, it, it's not the case, you know? So we, we are okay with not getting the perfect sinusoid and having some noise and all that stuff in the AC signal, but that's not the case for industrial setting. Okay, and a, a, a large number of companies actually manufacture these UPSs um, and they make quite a bit of money by selling these UPSs. So certainly something you can consider uh, you know, after graduation to work for, and you can get a sense of how intricate some of these UPSs designs are so that you can get a perfect sinusoid coming out of the UPS, even though the input is not a perfect sinusoid and perhaps has a, not a perfect frequency of 60 Hertz. Okay, so that's what I mean by these tolerances. These tolerances, now, now there are like 500 different types of UPSs around the world for different tolerances. So the more, the better tolerance you want, um, the more costly the UPS is going to be. Okay, so, so something that, you know, you, you just learn over the period of your lifetime that there are, there are approximations and there, are, there is a price that you need to pay to get that kind of approximation. Okay. 
so so far we have talked about um, any question so far i've been speaking non stop for quite some time okay so yeah so i do okay. have a quick question yes uh, in the transition period our section between the uh, yes. two edges yes. is that linear or is that more linear than it goes to a at um intuition or whatever no it could be highly nonlinear as well okay yeah so let's look at so this is a filter butterworth filter which is uh, this is the laplace transform uh, i guess i can't make so this is the Laplace transform of this Butterworth filter. And this is what the electric circuit looks like for the Butterworth filter. There is an input sinusoid. Oh, this is the input. And then you get the output on the other side. And I am, yeah, so this is what the pass band and the stop band looks like. Let me zoom in. So this is what the pass band and stop band looks like. So the linear case would be this blue line that you're seeing oh sorry this is the phase angle so this is the gain yeah so this is as you can see in this region which is the transition region the uh, the thing is non-linear it's not really linear that how i showed it in my diagram it's not that linear it's slightly non-linear in this situation this is the this is the pass band this area is the pass band this area is the stop band, and this is the transition region that you are, yeah, that you are seeing. Okay. So this brings me to Bode plot. So Bode plot is one way to represent the so we have so far talked only about the, the amplitude of the frequency response. So we have talked about H of J omega, absolute value of H of J omega, which is the magnitude of frequency response. But because H of J omega is the complex number, it also has a phase. This is called the phase of the frequency response. Okay, and Bode plot essentially tries to plot the magnitude and the phase of the uh, frequency response as a function of omega. So it comprises of, body plot comprises of two plots. So it's plot one, which is 20 log absolute value of H of J omega. This is along the Y axis. This is the Y axis and omega, log omega. This is all log base 10, by the way. So not the natural log, but the log base 10. This is the X axis. And then there is plot two, where you have angle of H of J omega along the Y axis and log base 10 of omega along the X axis. Okay. The 20 log base 10 absolute value of H of J omega, this is measured in decibel dB. 
B is capital, D is small decibel. That's just the way we measure the 20 log of H of J omega. Okay, let me tell you why this log and phase is important. So as you can see, we are plotting the magnitude in the log graph, but we are plotting the phase without the log. So the phase is the usual phase, but the magnitude, we have to take the log of the magnitude. Why is that important? Let's consider the following system. Okay, so I have two systems in series, H1 and H2. So the overall interconnection, the, trans, the frequency response of this overall system is going to be H1 J omega times H2 J omega. And the reason why it's multiplication is because in the time domain, the overall impulse response is going to be H1 convolution H2. So in frequency domain, we just have to multiply H1 of J omega and H2 of J omega. Now, if we have the body plot of H1, and I have the body plot of H2, turns out that the body of H1 times H2 is just going to be the sum. You add the two body plots, you get the body plot of the series interconnection of the two systems. Let's look at it why. Well, I'll let you write and then we'll go over why this is the case. Okay. So if you look at 20 log base 10 of H absolute value of H1 J omega, absolute value of H2 J omega. It's just 20 log 10 H1 J omega plus 20 log 10 H2 J omega. Same thing if I look at angle of H1 J omega times H2 J omega. What's the phase of multiplication of two complex numbers? It's the sum of phase of the two complex numbers. So it's angle H1 J omega plus angle H2 J omega. Okay, needless to say that we all love addition over multiplication. Addition is easy, we can do it by hand. Multiplication is quite difficult and we'll probably have to use computer to do multiplication. So by using the log scale along the Y axis for the magnitude and using the regular phase angle for the second plot along the y-axis. Um, if you have two systems in series interconnection uh, and, and you know the body plot of individual subsystems, you add the two subsystems, uh, the body plots, and you get the body plot of the interconnection. Fairly straightforward, uh, even if you want to do it by hand. 
So that's the benefit number one of Bodhi plot. Uh, uh, what was the other benefit? I had some one more benefit in mind, but I kind of forgot about it that I wanted to talk about. What else did I want to talk about for H of J omega? Never mind. I I forgot about it. So okay, anyways, the time is up. So we'll continue our discussion on body plot and we'll plot the body plot of several systems in the next class. And then we'll talk about uh, filter design using body plot. So thank you all and I'll stay back for any questions you may have. <laughs>